सबलाई नमस्कार मेरो नाम होम गुरुन आज टकले संसार भरी रहे अच्छा रह रहे का दाय दीदी बहनी दीदी बहनी रिश्तेदार सबलाई मिले आमंत्रण कर रहे हों यो काम आज हमें we are very lucky we have a professor Ellen McAllen from Cambridge University so today we will have our English Nepali and also Alikati Tamuti wherever possible so we will have presentation of you know multi language you know webinar by Professor Ellen McAllen. So about 50 years ago, uh, Professor Elaine uh, McFarlane uh, went to Khat village in Western Nepal, about four hours walk uh, from Pokhara, and where he did his PhD in 1968-69. So today we are very honored uh, to welcome uh, Professor Elaine McFarlane. Uh, and we have people from, uh, you know, today, in you know, a wide range of people from you know, 20 years to 95 years. Uh, also from the village, uh, all the way from the village and all the way from, you know, different countries around the globe. So it is my privilege uh, to welcome, I think many of you know, so we have uh, did an extensive research beyond his uh, PhD research in Nepal, in England, China, Japan, and Nepal. So already published uh, more than 20 books and also edited more than 20 books and also numerous, you know, journal publication. Uh, on social anthropology. Uh, I think today's talk will be very interesting and inspired, particularly the youth people, uh, youth who really want to know about their place, uh, about their village, about their ancestral ancest lands, where today many of us are you know, not in the village. Uh, but at the same time, it's very important to go there and to learn about the history of the gurus uh, and the people so that in the long run, we can really benefit uh, from our you know, ancestors. So uh, uh, this uh, talk today, uh, because we uh, there also be uh, you know uh, live on Facebook uh, through Tekanet and Martin Chowdhury, uh, Chajalu News, uh, Tomokita from Pokhara and uh, Nagrik uh, Khabar. Uh, it is also very important to know that this this program is jointly organized uh, in collaboration yes, with Martin Chowdhury, which is a uh, knowledge based and you know, uh, you know, focused on you know, uh, research. So we're very also you know, grateful uh, and thank you uh, Martin Chaudhary for joining uh, for this uh, as, as, our, as our partner. So uh, yeah, I think uh, because the talk is very, very useful, we also like to invite uh, your children who are behind you or sitting behind you to listen the talk uh, because they are very you know, rare and historic photographs that will highlight highlights in the past, uh, what tax looks like in the past 50 years ago, and since then, how it has been changing. I think that will give a uh, lots of, you know, um, sites of the village and how the groom societies or communities are transforming. So this is very, very important. And you are most welcome to invite your children, your near and dear ones, so that they will learn about uh, uh, today's talk. So, uh, Aile, uh, and uh, recently, uh, Professor uh, Alan has been a very interested in uh, visual anthropology. Lots of interest in visual anthropology. That will be also very you know, uh, in, uh, interesting, uh, inter interesting to learn. And uh, nevertheless, I'd uh, like to uh, welcome uh, Aile, uh, Aile, Alan, Nga Nas, Elia, Sikles, so, Sikles Sarbi Ani Thosan Asabai Kui Chodi Chodi Paragbu. So, nevertheless, we also try to speak uh, some gurus. Uh, so, for myself, uh, again, a uh, home guru, uh, I come from Sikles village, but I am currently based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, working for the Bird Life International for Singapore and Malaysia, uh, and looking after 15 countries uh, uh, around Asia as part of our program and our main office in Cambridge, uh, in, in, uh, where uh, Alan, uh, Professor and Alan is based. So I'd like to now welcome uh, Professor Alan uh, you know, for his uh, talk. Uh, and uh, namaste, Terry uh, Azulai Swagacha, Ekdam Swaganbu, Ki Talk Laira. Now, uh, please, uh, you can share uh, your screen. After the talk program, 
Today's Q&A session will be led by Dr. Ted Gurung, my colleague, Dr. Ted Gurung. So Dr. Ted Gurung uh, will take your questions. You can type all your questions in the chat box uh, and he will compile the question and read uh, for Professor Alain. Then he will do his best to answer. If they are very similar questions, we'll try to compile them. If we want more questions and more thoughts and also uh, uh, you know, different insights. Uh, about the talk. So take, uh, Dr. Tech lead the Q&A session after uh, the talk program uh, by Professor Ellen McFarland. So please uh, go ahead, uh, Professor Ellen McFarland. Um, so, Nga mi Ram Gurung, Nga Tosun Temme, Nga Beli Saint Tomba, Kilai Chugu Chugu Tomage Pomba, Nga Lentai Toso Ayaimu, Son Basa Ayaimu, Sile Nga Chugu Chugu Tomage Shemliai, Gara Madido. Uh, I hope you are all very well, and it is a great pleasure and privilege to talk to you. And very strange, after 50 years, when there was no electricity, no cars, nothing, now to be talking to Gurum friends all over the world. And a particular pleasure, because as you will see from my talk, um, the Gurungs mean a great deal to my wife, Sarah, and I. Uh, they have changed my life. So I would now like to talk to you, and I will talk quite slowly because I know that some of you, uh, English is a second or third language. So I will talk slowly about what I have learned from working with the Gurungs or Tamume. So, next slide. Many people ask me why I went to the Gurungs. I could have gone anywhere in the world, but why the Gurungs? Well, the story starts at my birth in Assam in um, Long, 1941, during the war, just before the Japanese entered the war. In fact, the day they went into Hong Kong, I think, December 1941. And I was born there, the son, of tea planter parents, my, but my father was in the army at the time, obviously. And so I was brought up for my first five years in Assam and India. And I think that's the main reason, ultimately, why I went back or went to the Gurungs, because I, as a child, I came to love and um, be very interested in India. And you can see that even when I'm about two years old here, where I'm with my best friend, my mother tells me, who was a sweeper's son, so lower caste, um, and we're sharing a duckling, as you can see there. So my first language, probably, or my second language was Urdu, although, of course, I've forgotten it all. And so from my memory of my first five years, there are dim memories of India and particularly of my ayahs who looked after me and who were from the hill tribes, the Garros and the Kasis, who are really very similar to the Gurungs. Um, they're all Tibeto-Burman speaking peoples and so I've always found such people particularly attractive and I if I was a psychologist, I would say it's because the first faces I saw when I was a baby were Tibetan Burman people. Anyway, I came back to England and uh, next slide. Next. Yeah, I'm doing. Nothing is happening. Um, is right, yep. That's it. So I came back to England and I studied um, history at Oxford University. But then I thought I would really like to learn to be an anthropologist. So I went to the London School of Economics and then 
where was I going to do field work? Well, I obviously wanted to go back to Assam and work with the Garas or the Kasis or the Nagas or some of the hill tribes of Assam. And um, there um, was the question of uh, who would supervise me. So I was appointed a supervisor from School of Oriental and African Studies, who you can see on the bottom left of the picture, Christoph von Führerheimendorf, the head of the department there, a really great anthropologist. He had worked in Hyderabad, he'd worked in Aranjal Pradesh, he'd worked famously with the Nagas, and he was the first Western anthropologist to go into Nepal in 1954. He was appointed my supervisor and tried to get me into the hills uh, of Assam, but there was a Naga rising at that time, so I couldn't go. And I said, well, where shall I go? And he said, what about Nepal? I'd never heard of Nepal, I don't think, at that time. So I said, well, where is that? So he got out a map and showed me where Nepal was. So I said, OK, um, where? And he said, well, I've tra traveled all over Nepal and I've been through an area in the Annapurna Mountains where people called the Gurungs live. And they are a very nice people. And I've been to Sikhlis and I filmed there and I've seen some strange rituals. And I, I advised a young man called Bernard Pignard, a Frenchman, to go and work as an anthropologist there. And he went and came back. And very sadly, he died shortly after he came back. And his book on the Gurungs, Le Gurung, has just been published. And it's a wonderful book, but there's obviously much more work to be done there. So why don't you go to the Gurungs? So I said, okay. And so within a month or two of that decision, without any language, without any training, without any knowledge, I set off for Nepal with my wife, my first wife, Jill. Next slide. Well, I think all of you watching this probably know where um, the Gurungs are but maybe you don't know where Tark is. Tark is just north of Pokhara. It's about four hours walk north of Pokhara, as you can see there. And in fact, the place I was meant to be going to was Siklis because it's a big Gurung village and Heimendorf said, go to Siklis. So I got trekking permission to go to Siklis. This is in 1968, 51 years ago. But um, when I set off, uh, as I'll explain, I gave up and stopped halfway at Tark. So we went by the Middle East. The planes had to stop many times. So we stopped in the Middle East and then we stopped in Delhi and then we went to Kathmandu. Next slide. You won't believe what Kathmandu was like then. This is Swam Banut, uh, which you'll all know. And as you see, all around at the bottom, there are no houses. It was just the monastery. And um, that's how Kathmandu was then. Next slide. Um, beautiful, of course, because the temples and the way of life were still much as it had been for hundreds of years. This is soon after Nepal opened to Westerners 14 years after and um, there were hardly hotels perhaps half a dozen or so hotels and you could buy all things just kerosene lamps two things so we stuck with a, a few things there and the only way to go to Pokhara then there was no road from Kathmandu of course or anywhere else you either had to walk there or you had to fly so we flew to Pokhara next slide Again, it's difficult, it'd be difficult for younger people to know what Pokhara was like in 1968. This is the center around Mahendra Pool with the fishtail mountain behind, as you see. And as you see, people carrying things on the back. There's my wife sitting in front of a little um, pagoda there in red. And 
I think there were six cars in Pokhara, all taxis. There were about four hotels. The only food you could get in any of the hotels was fried eggs as a Westerner. Obviously you could get dal bart. But that was it. Um, nothing. Nothing there. A small hospital of, kind, of a kind in government offices, but that's it. Next slide. And this is the sort of average street. This is the back way um, up to the center of Pokhara. Um, Newa sort of architecture, which has all of course been pulled down. And this would now just be one traffic jam. Um, but that's how it was. Next slide. And this is Lakeside. If any of you have been to Lakeside Pokhara, you'll know it doesn't look like that now. Now, if I would have bought this bit of land and now be a multimillionaire, because of course it's absolutely filled with hotels and restaurants and so on. Land is probably more expensive than in Cambridge. But there's my wife, Jill, with um, the lake behind. And that was Pokhara. Anyway, we stocked up and prepared ourselves and, next slide, set off. We took the uh, wet season route by mistake. And so it took us two days to get to Tark. And Tark is up on the, near the top of the slope. Um, you can see one or two houses down a little bit from the top. And that is Tark on this very, very steep rocky hillside. Uh, a very rough path path up to it, the last bit, which you had to walk, actually pull yourself up by your hands. You could hardly walk on it. And um, so after two days of struggling, we arrived exhausted in Tark and asked where we were and they said Tark. And so we thought, well, and they said, why don't you stop here? You're obviously exhausted, you can't on cyclists. We stopped in Tark or Tolson as it's known. Next slide. This is the village as it was in 1968 looking down from above the village and you can see the pass down and then in the distance you can see the long plain, river plain down to Pokhara which I walked up and down for the first 16 or 17 times that we've been to Tark and then later there was a road and you can see that the house is right pitched on the top of this hill. People often wonder why Gorong villages are built on the top of ridges and one reason is that it's a very ecologically sensible place because the Gorongs originally were very dependent on the forest and they had their buffalo there and they cut their wood and, and so on. So if they would put their villages right down in the plains, there would have been a huge distance to go up to the forests. So they're halfway between their grain fields lower down to the valley and their forest resources above. The other reason is that they are highland people and they've come down, as the tech has explained in a previous talk, come down from much higher regions and rather than just going straight down into the plains, they like to be on the top of mountains. There may also have been at one time a military reason because it was much more warlike in the 18th and 19th century and it was easier to defend a mountain village. Next. This is looking up at the village from below. Um, and again, you can see that the houses are pretty substantial. The Gurungs, compared to other Nepali groups at that time, were rich because they were one of the main recruiting groups for the Gurkhas, obviously. And in fact, in the middle, you can see um, something I hadn't noticed before. You can see a group of people in white, very small. That's in front of the uh, day school or night school, uh, and our house was next to that. Next.
this is the, our house. Um, we asked where we could stay and um, someone said, well, um, Colonel uh, or Lieutenant I.B. Gurung, who was away in the army, has an empty house. And I think you could stay there for a few weeks. And we stayed there for a few weeks. And then they said, well, you could stay a bit longer. And so we stayed there the whole time, the whole 15 months we were in Tark. You can see uh, the house on the right and the day, night school in the distance. Uh, and you can actually see um, some of the people who may be watching this um, in the picture. But it was a shock to come to a Gurung house from a, our English background. To begin with, you slept on the ground floor and not upstairs as you would in England. Second, there was no chimney, so the house was just filled with smoke all the time when you were cooking. And of course, there was no electricity, no running water, nothing really, just the house. Um, though it was a very cozy little house owned by I.B. Gurung with his mother living in the house next door. Next. One of the, uh, which isn't often talked about by anthropologists is how you actually survive because you have to learn the new skills, cooking on a, a wood fire, for example, this is my wife, Jill, um, with Rupa Gurung, um, I.B.'s uh, daughter on the left, sitting next to me there. And every evening we'd cook like this. And the evening meals are one of the big social times, traditionally with the Gurungs, as you know. So every evening, lots of children and adults would come into our house, crowd around like this and watch us. And it was pretty difficult because we're used to very private life in England, suddenly to have people sitting there talking in a language you don't understand, commenting, laughing at what you're doing. So it's a bit of a shock, a huge shock in fact, but um, Jill coped and this is towards the end of our time because she's wearing a or at least a, a Nepali dress, which she didn't do it at the beginning. So we had to learn how to buy, cook, and all the other things you do in a Gurung village. Next slide. In the evenings when they came in, um, luckily I'd brought my guitar with me and I'd been quite keen and had a little guitar group when I was at school. So I knew some Western songs and so on. And so we used to sit round and sing songs. It was very strange going back in 1986 for the first time after 15 years and in the evenings people again came into our house and they came in and they start, started singing Hey Lordy Pick a Bale of Cotton, Hey Lordy Pick a Bale of Hay which is the songs we had sung together 15 years earlier and so I had the imagination that one day another anthropologist would come to the village and wonder how the, these people had picked up Western folk songs uh, in this village, but that's the reason. Anyway, um, music is very important to the Gurung, so being able to play an instrument and singing along with the Gurungs was, I think, very important. Next. This gives you a sense of the view from Tark, absolutely wonderful underneath Annapurna 4 with the village of Sickless, the big village you see in the far distance on the slope and another three or four hours at least walk from here. And Jill and I are going off with our washing. We went off every week. We went off just both to wash and also to have a little bit of privacy because one of the most difficult things for a Westerner to come into a Gurung village is the absence of any privacy. The doors are always open for people to come in People are always interested in what you're doing. Even when we went off to have a wash and a shower, um, often people would try and come with us because they felt we really needed company. But um, this was the Sunday walk and we'd have one small piece of chocolate and um, as a special treat. Next. This is the center of the village, the water tap um, and of course, there was no proper water supply. You often have to wait several hours to get your gauri filled. 
and this at night was the meeting place we were told of the witches and I'll talk more about them soon. Next. Another shock, um, remember we had no language, we didn't understand a word of Gurung because there was no Gurung dictionary or anything we could have learned from, so we were, but three days after we arrived we were beckoned to come down to a village below Tark and they said something was going on there so we went down and we were thrown into this huge crowd of people um, doing strange things, dancing around and um, doing various rituals. I had no idea what it was, but it turned out to be one of the most important, the most important Gurung ritual, the Pue uh, or Pue Lava, the three day memorial ritual that the Gurungs have. And one of the things that happens as an anthropologist is that the first time you see something like this is a complete bedlam. You don't know anybody, you don't know what's happening. We went to a number of these and by a year into our field work, of course, we knew the people, we had some idea of the structure of what was going on. Anyway, it was here that I first drank pa or rakshi and I remember sitting in the dark feeling absolutely woozy because I didn't realize how strong it was. Um, but a drink of pa every evening was one of the pleasures of being in a gurung household. Next. Um, what you do obviously is gather as much um, information as you can about the people. Uh, very difficult working conditions. It took me five months back again, took me five months to get this table made in the village by the local carpenter. So that was a big step forward. So I sat upstairs and took my field notes and so on. Next. We were very young, I was uh, 27 when we went, uh, and Jill 26. So it was my first real adventure away from England, apart from small travels, and a big shock. Next. What made it easier and made a huge difference was that within, two or three days of arriving, the evening after we arrived, someone came in with a torch, the man on the top left, came in with a torch, shone it around our little room and said, how are you? And I was amazed. Here was someone speaking English. And he said, well, my name is Lieutenant Bowen Singh Gurung. Um, I've been to England several times. So we started talking about London and the underground and so on. And he became my father. He said, I'm going to adopt you as my son. Um, that's Nandalal, his son on the right there. And so you are part of our family. So we did the little ritual to adopt, uh, adopt me. And that meant that I treated all his family as my family. I have called him Abba and call his wife below Amma. Uh, I'd call his children Nani, Moili, and so on and so on. And indeed, the relationship became ever stronger. In the, sadly, a few years later, Nandalal, his son, was killed or died in the army. And so, in a way, I became his proto son. So that when he did his funeral and his wife did their funerals, I attended and was a, a chief mourner in them. But they shielded and helped and occasionally helped us over various crises of shortage of money and so on. So I owe a huge amount to Bowen Singh Gurung and his family who have remained close friends and particularly to his adopted, his brother's adopted daughter. His brother died and so Dilmaya Gurung, who you see there at about 16, I'll talk more about later in white, um, changed my life more than almost anyone. On to the next. My chief informant at that time, who I worked with most closely, was someone about my own age, Prem uh, Bahadur Gurung, 
who you see here making uh, a rain shield. Prem was, had good English and very intelligent. He was the son of the local Hoju or shaman. And we became very close friends. And a lot of my talk will be about friendship because that's the way you learn about a, another society. So Prem was enormously important and helped me greatly. And I kept in touch roughly. Next. And so when I went back on one of the later trips in the 1990s, there is Prem who had moved to Kathmandu and then back to Pokhara. He may even be watching this, and if he is, <coughs> I wish him all happiness and many, many thanks for all his work. <coughs> so, Prem um, was one of the people who really taught me about Goran society. Next. <coughs> Next door was um, Ibi's mother, and here she is. And she's, um, as you see, weaving. And the old skills of the Gurungs in weaving and making basket work and so on and so on were very alive at that time, though many of them, of course, have partly died out now. Next. Prem's father, Ujje Singh Gurung, here, uh, was one of the leading shamans or poju uh, of that area. And gradually, although he didn't speak English, as my gurung began to improve after about six or eight months, he and I began to work closely, closer together. My study was about economics and population, but I could see how interesting and important the gurung rituals and myths were, the Pue Lu San. And so I began to work with him and he'd come in every day and we'd spend an hour or two and I would try and write down an account of and myths. And here he is with all his equipment. Next. Another shock and a, a, an interesting story was that appeared in his wonderful book, on the Gurungs had captured much of it, but he'd, got one, he'd made one big mistake. He'd said, the Gurungs don't believe in witchcraft, in Boshi. I don't know why he said that, but I can understand perhaps, because when I asked about uh, witchcraft, because I'd done my PhD or my DPhil in England on English witchcraft in the 17th century, that was my historical PhD, and so, I naturally asked about it and they said, oh, no, no, we don't have any of that. But by chance, um, the proofs of my book, which was published shortly afterwards on witchcraft, came out when I was in the field and I was going through them and Prem said, what's that? And I explained and I said, well, you know, you won't quite understand because this is thing called witchcraft, which you don't have here. He said, what do you mean? And so, of course, the Gurungs traditionally did believe in witches. Boshi. And this was, there were about 15 known supposed witches in Tark at that time. And this was one who was supposed to be a witch. Of course, um, most people don't believe in witchcraft now, but anyway, at the time she was supposed to be a witch. Next. Two of the little boys in the village, Komal Bahadur Gurung and Servajit Gurung, who were about 13 and at school, were among my best informants because they'd come in every evening for hot chocolate and so on. And we would talk about what they'd be doing in the day. Very intelligent, very nice boys. And so I was delighted many years later when I went back to discover that Komal had gone to Bombay and we met him there, we went down and stayed with him in Bombay. But he then came to the village and here he is. So this is a reunion after 35 or 40 years with one of my close friends, uh, aged, who was then aged 13 when I knew him. Next. 
Another very important person was a man called Brickeras Gurung, who was a very senior member of the village. He'd been crippled and unable to leave, and he knew the village very well. And in particular, he had the village taxation and land records, the Tiriij and others, uh, in his house, or got them there. And so, as I was very interested in reconstructing land ownership for the last 50 or 80 years, I would walk down, it was quite a long, steep walk, about an hour down, or a little less, to his house. And every day, for some months, we'd work together on these land records. His um, son, A.K. Prasad, also became my teacher. He was the schoolmaster in the village. And his younger brother, Chandra Prasad, became the health worker there. So the whole family were very helpful. Next. You may have got some idea that it's both very rewarding and also extremely stressful living in a Gurung village. We were very lonely, we were quite often sick, particularly my wife, um, homesick. It was very tough, one of the toughest experiences in my life. And I was, for some of the time, I was counting the hours until I'd be back in libraries and with my friends and with hot baths and all the rest of it. Um, so it was rather strange that at the end, after 15 months there in January 1970, when we had to leave, it was one of the most painful, sad experiences of my life. I remember feeling absolutely upset. The Ujjay Singh, the Pochu, came in and did a ritual over me, which calmed me, but both my wife and I were terribly upset. And I, now, thinking about it, it's obvious that we've become so part of this warm, meaningful community that leaving it was really difficult and here they're saying goodbye to us and they said come back soon and we said we'll come back soon um, but it wasn't soon enough next because i went back to england i wrote my book on the gurungs resources and population which came from my phd i got a job as a lecturer in anthropology at Cambridge. Um, I remarried um, and thereby got two young daughters with my second wife Sarah and we couldn't really get away until they were old enough, until they were 16. Next. Um, but we did some work on the Gurungs. I'd done a translation with Jill of Bernard Pinyard's book, The Gurungs, which you can get in Kathmandu or elsewhere from Ratna Pustak. And then Sarah and I retranslated it. And that book, plus mine and plus one or two other things, mean that the Gurungs are one of the best written about societies, Messrs. Smith's book and so on. Um, one of the best recorded in published books. Um, ethnic minority groups in, in Nepal. Next. When we did go back, it was 1986, so 15 years later, and we went back and um, I went with Sarah and I said, well, let's just go back. They'll all have forgotten me and uh, we'll just go for a couple of weeks and I'll show you what it was like. Anyway, of course, when we went back, they hadn't forgotten us. Everyone said, oh, where have you been? We were waiting for you, et cetera. And Bowen Singh and I met IB and Gurung, who I'll explain in a minute. So it was so warm and welcoming. And Gurung life was so interesting that Sarah, at the end of two weeks, said, I'm not leaving unless you promise to come back again next year. So I, of course, said, yes, we will. And we did come back next year. And both times we'd stayed in a Gurung house. But after those two times, they said, well, if you're going to come back often, why don't you build a little house yourself? So we built this little house 
uh, or had it built in um, a courtyard um, of Bonsing's stepdaughter or adopted daughter Dilma's house. And so we were in a Gurung courtyard. We had a separate place where we could sleep and I could work peacefully. So it was an ideal arrangement. And that house is still there. And if you ever go to Tark, you can visit it. Next. Um, this is just to show you us dressed up in rather formal Gurung costume um, about this time, 1988, um, with Indra Bahadur Guru, my uncle on the left, and Badra Singh, my second adopted father, on the right. And you'll hear more about Indra Bahadur in a minute. But normally I wouldn't be dressed like this, but Sarah did take the trouble of dressing in Guru or Nepali costume, which was very much appreciated. Next. Obviously, what you have to do as an anthropologist is to forget your own beliefs and religion and so on and enter into the spirit of the place you go to so when i hurt my finger my thumb um and went back to tuck uh, i consulted the uh, danaram um the local um one of the local uh healers and here he is trying to heal my finger Unfortunately, it didn't work. Um, so when I went, he said, send me a postcard if it doesn't work. But of course, he doesn't read and there was no post, so I couldn't do that. But when I went back, I said, um, why didn't it work? And he said, oh, well, the chicken you gave me was too small. It's probably true. Anyway, uh, you actually participate in the, the belief system of the society, which I was doing here. Uh, the National Health Service had managed to cure it, so it might have, might have worked, but it didn't. Next. Anthropology's method is participant observation. You participate in a society and you meet. So, um, Sarah and I did a little bit of each thing, wood carrying, wood chopping, carrying water, and here doing some um, hoeing in the fields with Dilmeyer on the right. What you learn from this, the two great advantages of this, one is that the people see that you're not um, a snooty Westerner who thinks manual labor working in the fields and so on is below you, so you're quite prepared to do it. But they realize very quickly, and you realize very quickly, that you can't do it. You're not strong enough, it's too difficult, and just one minute of doing this in the hot sun was more than I could take. And I began to appreciate the hugely difficult work of Guru life in the fields as it was traditionally then. Next. As I mentioned, you learn nearly, I learned everything I know about the Gurungs really from people. And Bhadra Singh, who I've mentioned before, my second adopted father on the left here was one of those people. If you're very fortunate, as I was, you meet two or three people who know Gurung society or the society really well. And Bhadra Singh, who had lived in the village her life, he'd been crippled and couldn't move out. So he'd stayed there and he'd made a study of it. He was a kind of anthropologist. And so he knew everything about the village, really. So I could sit here and make notes. I could travel around the village in my mind with him. And he would say, well, in this household, there's so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And they have three oxen, 10 chickens. Um, he was away in the army last year. Their income is this and so on and so on. So he knew everything. And he also knew the deeper side of Gurung life which um, people didn't normally talk about. So after some years, and once he got to trust us, he told us the secret history of the village. That is the real relationships between people, what really happened, as well as his knowledge of the history. So we have all this. I have it all in my computer and a database. But of course, much of it is very confidential. 
and one of our problems is to know what to do with this material um, so it's neither lost nor becomes a danger to any living individuals. But Bhadra Singh was a fountain of knowledge. Next. The other way you learn about a society is not from the old and the wise, but from the very young and friendly. And here we have a very important person in my life, Prem Kumari Gurung. Now Prem Kumari Gurung was my sister Dilmaya, who you've heard about, Bowen Singh's daughter. So Bowen Singh's granddaughter, Prem Kumari. And I knew her from about the age of one, just a little bit older than this, about two. And I made a film record of her life. So I've got many hours of film of her and her mother interacting, which I later did with my own granddaughters. And I watched her grow from two to 10 or 12. We were very, very close. And she was a great help and informant. Next. For example, when Sarah was trying to learn Gurung, one of her main teachers was M. Kumari, as you see here, trying to teach her how to pronounce Gurung words. Next. And sharing things here, Sarah is with M. Kumari watching a ritual and they could discuss it and um, share the emotions of watching a ritual. Next. One of the things you have to learn, which luckily I didn't find too difficult, is to be a child again or to be foolish. Um, if you're in a Guru society, you have to be playful. And, and so you see me here dancing with the children. So I was always prepared to dance or sing or enter into things because I'd done this all my life in various ways. And it was a great pleasure to share the life of children. Of course, children have more time and often more patience than adults who are busy. And so we learnt a lot from young children, particularly the early time of learning the language. Next. You have to see um, the world you enter from very, very inside it. And I like this picture because this this is me filming a ritual I, I'll talk about in a minute, the Gato, Gato Sheba, a very famous three-day dance of the Gorongs. And this is the actual angle I'm taking at. So I'm participating and observing. I'm participating because they're doing the final dancing over our head with uh, a, little, a bowl of, with some rice in. And this girl is dancing over my head but I'm also observing, in other words, filming at the same time from this angle. Next. I've talked about Dilmaya from time to time, and she was probably the, the most important guru for me. She was um, 10 years younger than me. Um, and I'd known her when she was 16. And then again, when we went back, and we made our house in her courtyard. And so we spent from 1988 to 1995, some seven years, every year we went back and I filmed her relationship with her daughter, but also her wider life and got very, very close to her. She was my sister and we treated each other as brother and sister. Very intelligent and um, charming and helpful person. I, I think you've had a talk about Napoli Amma and she was a kind of Napoli Amma. The closeness of the relationship is shown in, in this little bit from a film. My wife Sarah used to wash Prem Kumari, uh, Dilmaya's daughter's hair, to wash my hair. Now, 99% of societies, there's no way you could ask a, a married woman, particularly as an outsider and as a white person and so on, to wash your hair. It's a very intimate thing. But she said, of course. 
So she washed it and you can see her laughing because she said, you haven't got much hair to wash. But anyway, she washed it. And this is a sign of the sort of closeness and the lack of um, distance which we managed to establish. Next. Even closer at the uh, annual Baitika festival where sisters bless their brothers. She's blessing me and Sarah on my left. And she, as part of this, as you may know, you actually feed, the sister feeds the brother. And here she is actually feeding me. Now there's nothing much more uh, close than being fed in the mouth like this by another human being. And so we were really, really very close. Next. Here she is um, when I was filming her because one of the things I did in 1998 films, which have um, been translated by Anita Gurung, who is helping with this broadcast. And they are an overview of a Gurung woman's life, um, all her dreams, her hopes, her fears, what she does, and so on. Very frankly spoken to me in two minutes. 12 of them or 10 of them. And I'll explain later how you can see this if you want to. And so one of my many plans is to write a book about her. I have written it, but I haven't yet published it, which would be a, a very unusual study of a Gurung woman. Um, tragically, in 1995, I suddenly got a message to say that she died. She was only 42, but she'd been working very hard and had a heart attack. She had a weak heart. And so her death was more um, powerful and made me more unhappy than <laughs> any other. <laughs> Sorry? Can you see this? So, shall I go on? Yep. So this is um, the memorial which the family put up for Dilmaya. And you can see this when you go into, as you enter Tark, you'll see this plaque, which is there, uh, the memory yes, of yes. her. So, shall I go on? Yep. Mm. Next. So this is Next, um, the, the day she died, which was the 7th of April, 1995, um, we planted this little tree. It was a small tree then, Cotinus, in our garden. So we knew it as the Dilmaya tree. Sadly, it died two or three years ago and had to be cut down. But this was a memory of a very, very important and helpful person in my life, Dilmaya Gurung. Next. In 1969, I went to Kathmandu and found that they were selling video cameras. This was the video camera I bought in 1969. And very, very simple. It, the films were three minutes. There was no zoom, no sound, etc. But at least I had it. And I took films in 1969, which are up on the internet, as I'll explain at the end. So there is some visual record of that village then. Uh, it was partly influenced by the fact that my supervisor, Führer Heimendorf, was a great filmmaker, the, perhaps the greatest anthropological filmmaker of all time in terms of the width of his filmmaking. And so I was encouraged to take photographs, films, recordings. And so this was the beginning of filming Tark. Next. 1987, uh, the Japanese had brought out proper video cameras, not this one, but video eight, which was lower quality. And this was a revolution. I mean, now you had an hour of film, much cheaper, um, with a, a zoom lens um, and sound. And then in 92, a better one, Hi8. And 
my main filming was done on this particular camera, a high eight camera. And I have made this video record of a life in a Gurung village, particularly from 88 onwards, which I think is unique. Hundreds of hours of film, which are some of them available to you. Next. This is just um, the, uh, the earliest film, Tark 69, just on my computer. And these are just clips of Tark 1969. Um, I think I've got, I don't know, 10,000, 12,000 film clips on Tark uh, over the time. In 1992, for example, made about 30 hours of film in Tark. And all this is going to be preserved and I hope available for future generations of Gurungs. Next. One of the places it's on is on YouTube. And I'll give you at the end, if you pause it at the end and want to take um, a photograph of the screen, I'll give you the uh, URLs, the links to um, where these films are available. But they're available on YouTube. If you search for Ayabaya, is the name my grandchildren gave me and is my YouTube channel. So there are a whole lot of Gurung films there. Next. And they're also on the Cambridge University um, website, the streaming media service. I'll give you these links at the end. So you see a whole lot of films, 93 films on field work with the Gurungs. 132 films made in my first field work, and so on. So, masses of film material. Next. One of the things that I learned from the Gurungs was about hard work. The Gurungs, as you saw, and as I'm sure you know, live on the side of very steep mountains. And this is looking down from Tak to the river, the Modicola. And the rice fields are down at the bottom, then the maize fields, and then the village. And you have to do this agriculture on this very steep slope. And of course, there's no way of getting the grain, for example, from the fields up to the village, except carrying it. So you're on your back, you're carrying huge weights, which I couldn't even lift, again and again and again. All the Farming is done more or less by human labor with some oxen, obviously, and so on, but um, very little input of anything non-human labor. So it's really tough. And how the Gurungs did this on the diet, which they had at that time, the Gurungs and the others in the village, the tailors and blacksmiths and so on, is really a mystery to anthropologists. I had a biological anthropology uh, interested friend, Simon Strickland, who was also an anthropologist, and he did a study of Gurung diet. And there's no way you can see how on the diet they had, they could have had the energy to do this. And yet they did. Next. This was brought home for me. I, I was lived as a, uh, a young uh, person in um, the Lake District in the north of England. And that was where the steepest mountain in England called Scarfell Pike was. And in the bottom part of the diagram, you can see the steepest mountain in England, 3,200 feet from the lake up to the mountain. And if you compare the angles, which I climbed up and seem very steep to me with Tark angles, you go from the river to the village, you can see it's steeper than anything of any British mountain. And then if you go on up to the jungles higher up, it's a hugely difficult slope you're farming on. Um, and of course, uh, there's no way any European farmer or anything could farm and make any living from this sort of rocky hill um, mountain. Next. Another shock and that thing I learned from the Gorong and probably the most, one of the most important, I was brought up as a Christian 
and as a Protestant Christian. And as such a person and my world in the West, we believed that religion was something you were of a certain religion. You were a, a Christian or a, a Muslim or a Jew or whatever. And that you believed in one God and all other faiths and so on, you couldn't believe in. You couldn't both be a, a, a Muslim and a Christian, for example, and you couldn't be a, a Muslim and a Buddhist. Uh, so religions were exclusive. So when I went to Tark, that's how I thought the world really operated. Of course, when I arrived, I found that the people in Tark weren't like that. To begin with, they were Hindus, or at least they did many Hindu rituals and pujas. Here they are doing the big annual sacrifice of animals, sacrificing a buffalo. And next, they were also Buddhists, although this isn't traditional Buddhism. So I've got um, films of Buddhism, but this is the other sort of religion they had. This is pre-Buddhist Bonpo religion of Tibet before Buddhism arrived. These are the Clevery priests. So they were Hindus, they were Buddhists, they were Bonpo. Next. And of course, they believed in a huge world of spirits and so on, which anthropologists call shamanism. So they had shamans, and here is Ujjay Singh and his son in a shamanic ritual, and as a poju. Um, they also believed in ancestors, and they also had other kinds of spirits. So they had about five or six different, what I would had to call religions at the same time. How could you do this? Completely strange. Later, when I went to Japan and went to China, I found great civilizations doing the same thing. And I realized it was me who was strange in the West, having a single God and a monotheistic religion. But this was one of the great shocks of going and what I learned from the Gurung. Next. Another shock was for the first time to encounter people going into trance. That is leaving their bodies and going their spirits going off into another world. And this is one of the great ritual dances, the Gato Sheva, three day dance, which is danced a little bit in remote Gurung villages, but I've got quite a bit of film of it. In the daytime, you would dance the Gato. In the evening, you, if you were fortunate, you might get to see the night dance, which is the Kusun. Uh, I won't explain it, but the Kusun dance is very different. And here you have young girls, next, going into trance and dancing. They're inhabited by strange spirits. And Gurung girls are normally very gentle, peaceful, kind and, and so on and so on. But when the Kusun Dyota comes into them, they become very different. Next. And they can, they dance for a while, but if anyone says the word buffalo, shouts out buffalo, they go mad, they go berserk. They start waving their arms around, beating people, as you see this girl is about to do, maybe trying to take their clothes off completely. They have to be calmed down and taken out of the trance. I can't put this film up because um, the rhythms that are played may be dangerous. So I can just show you slides of this very strange Kusun dance. Next. The biggest ritual is the three-day memorial, Pue Lava. And again, there's a lot of analysis. I've done a lot of analysis and film of this, which you can watch. At Dill Meyer's memorial, 
we went back uh, for it. And as I was her brother, and therefore Sarah was sister-in-law, we had to partake centrally in the rituals. And here Sarah is combing with Dilmaya's comb, the sheep. It's believed that the spirit, of course, goes up to the land of the dead, the Planasa. And um, to do this, they come down into the village and Dilmaya's come down into the village and gone into this sheep. And another sheep, the friend of this sheep, will also go up to the land of the dead. So Sarah's combing Dilmaya's hair there and they're showing Dilmaya her face in a mirror. This is Dilmaya's mirror and the sheep looks in it and sees herself as Dilmaya. But what is really extraordinary next is that it's believed that after having a huge feast, the sheep eat all sorts of biscuits and sweets and all sorts of things for a while. And then they go off and they're sh they're, have their heads cut off. And I was told that when they take out the stomach, all the things they've eaten have disappeared. There's no food in it, no sweet wrappings, no orange peel. So Tech Gurung, who's involved with this meeting and I'll talk about later, went off and filmed this and photographed it. And here you see the stomach being examined. And indeed, he tells me there was nothing in it, no food. So how do you explain that? Next. Equally or even stranger, and I don't know how many of you have seen these, but um, Yajung Gorong, who is a very well-known Pochu and um, very learned Pochu, who is on the right, uh, more or less, um, the third from the left, was doing a ritual in Yanjakot, and a young man from an English university went and photographed this, and he came to see me um, with some photographs and said, Alan, <coughs> can you explain my photographs? I don't understand. So he projected them on the wall in our department. And photograph number 20 was like this, the shamans in the middle of a very long, complicated and important ritual, summoning witches or dead spirits down. Photograph number 20 was like this. Next. Photograph number 21, a few seconds later, was like this. And you see all these lights. When I showed this to Yajong, who actually walked in a few minutes afterwards, he said, good heaven. I said, well, what is it? And he said, those are my spirits. That's what I see in my trance. The long line above me is my God protecting me. Other lines are my ancestors coming down to defend me. And other lines are witches attacking me, the three kinds of spirits I see. And that's exactly what I see in my trance, but it's come out on a photograph. So I sent this back to Kodak or I sent uh, a copy and they said they couldn't explain it. And I showed it to an expert on paranormal phenomena and they said, well, it could be the lens had stuck or something like that. But the chance of it happening at that particular point in the ritual is millions and millions to one. So another thing the Gurungs introduced me to was the fact that there may be other worlds than those which I've conceived of, a parallel worlds. So I keep my mind open on these matters. Next. I also saw for the first time a dead body and a dead body being burnt, which is happening down by the river here. And that is quite a shock for someone from the West uh, who hasn't encountered death head on. And so I learned a little about, bit about important things in life like death. Next. Then I came back and of course, all my visits to Nepal were punctuated by months in Cambridge. This is my college in Cambridge, King's College, Cambridge, which I hope some of you have visited and will visit. My room is in the white building on the right. And this is the famous chapel. So I lived in two parallel worlds myself, just as strange as other parallel worlds. When I was in Cambridge, 
the gurungs and tak seemed like a dream. And when I was in tak, this seemed like a dream. Next. And of course, the task now was to make sense of all the material we were gathering after field work after field work. 20 trips we have made to Tak, I have made to Tak. And you can see some of the field work notes on the desk there behind the computer and the others elsewhere. So how do you process all this huge amount of information? We fortunately had been setting up databases so we have everything in a multimedia database so that you can find any date or any film or anything there. But it, of course it took a huge amount of work and this is my library in Cambridgeshire. Next. One of the people who helped me sort it all out was Indra Bahadur Gurung, Lieutenant I.B. Gurung, who I'm delighted is participating in this um, meeting and is here online from Hong Kong. One of my, he's my sort of uncle, a distant uncle, and he and I work together. He's a great expert on Gurung history and helped me understand that a great deal. And we had various projects together, um, which enriched my life enormously. Next. One of them was to write a book together, Guide to the Gurungs, which is the, this is the cover of the little book we wrote together, which is published by Ratna Pustak in Kathmandu. Next. The more important was that he suggested that Gurung culture was dying out, much of the knowledge and shamanic traditions were dying out. So this needed to be saved. So we had a meeting of many of the Pochu and Clavery in Pokhara in the 1990s. And from that meeting, um, thanks to the donations and help of many Gurungs around the world, he raised the money to build a Coimbo, a um, very important Gurung cultural center, museum, and also religious center. And it was designed by IB, I believe, with these Kedu, which are uh, the corners, which are taken from a Gurung ritual. So it has a very distinctive, interesting design. And next. This is more what it looked like when it was finished. Um, and then there was another big um, building for other activities next door. And so if you go to Pokhara, I hope you'll visit this and support it in whatever way you can, because it's a very, very important uh, institution, which has also spread to other parts of Nepal. And I think is one of the origins of the Tamu Pier Lusan, uh, organizations around the world. So Ibi Gurung is really one of the central people who've helped to preserve and save Gurung culture and I thank him for that. Next. Another person who helped me more in my general knowledge of Nepal and its history and culture was um, Colonel John Cross, who you see here, who also may be watching this. I hope he is, and if he is, I send my warmest greetings to him and Buddhiman and his family. Uh, John Cross knows Nepal better than almost anyone has ever known it. He speaks Nepali perfectly, and he's lived there for many years and is a Nepali citizen and a multilinguist, and has written and published many books. And so meeting John each time we went to Pokhara has been a, a great delight and I'm glad to hear he's still walking many miles every day and looking at people in that enigmatic way. Next. Another person who helped greatly was Shana or Bikash Gurung, uh, who is the youngest son of Dilmaya and who acted as our field rich worker assistant in our later years and helped us in many ways. And so we've had projects with Shana, who also I hope is watching this from Pokhara with his family, to whom I also send warmest greetings. Next. Another person is also watching this and involved in it is Tek Gurung and Anita, his wife, who you see here, praying at Kokuno Lake, uh, Xinjiang Lake 
in northern China. And he talked about this in a previous um, lecture, so I won't go into it, but this is the origin of the Gurungs are around this lake. So it's been a great privilege to remain friends with my former student, Tech Gurung, who did his PhD in China and has made a huge contribution to our understanding of the early history of the Gurungs. Next. Of course, many other Gurung uh, family. Dilmaya's uh, sister, Kaji, was my sister, and Kaji's daughter here, Manu Gurung, is with us here at a Tamu Pierre Lusang meeting in London, uh, or near London, recently. So the Gurung community in England is important. Next. And also around the world. The other little boy who was there with me was Servajit Gurung, and he's on my right here, a grown man in Hong Kong with Gurungs from Hong Kong. Next. With Shana, or Bikash, as I mentioned, uh, we set up a, uh, or he set up a trekking company. And if this talk has interested you and you have a chance to go to Pokhara, you couldn't do better than to get in touch with Dil Maya Treks and Tours. That's easy to remember, Dil Maya Treks and Tours. And um, Shana, because he knows my family and my history, has worked with us and uh, knows Tark very well, speaks good English, runs different kinds of tours and walks up to the village along the old path if you want, which we did. So it it's, would be a wonderful way to learn about what you've seen in this films is to actually experience it by going with Shana up to Tark and beyond. Next. And recently he built a tented camp above in the place where the old Gurung village of Tark used to be, it moved down from here about 200 years ago. And this has wonderful views and this would be the beginning of a, a great walk up through Tark Forest and around the villages to the north. Next. When I retired in 2009, first thing I did, of course, was to go back to Tark. And here is Sarah and I returning. I'm 67 at the time and it began um, my retirement in a wonderful way going back to the village. Next. And of course, going back to Kathmandu, another project with Tech Gurung, he translated a part of a book of mine, Letters to Lily, and this was launched in Kathmandu a few years ago. And you can see the launch party here. Next. Um, if this talk has interested you, Another way of following it up is um, I've written a book called Becoming an Anthropologist, which is an account of that first field work with many photographs in it. Um, you can uh, download it from my website for free as a PDF. W, I'll give you the website at the end. If you go uh, to life, uh, under life, you will see the PDF as a free PDF, but you can also buy it on Amazon. And so this is the only account I know of, of what it's actually like to work in another part of the world as an anthropologist. So it's got all the letters I wrote home at, from the time and my diaries and everything, and films and photographs. Next. Um, that's the website. So if you go to www.alanmcfarlane.com and look under life on the top left, it'll give you that and other things which I'll mention. Next. These are the links. Um, so um, I hope you can see the whole of this, but you can see the films at YouTube there and you, you could take a photograph of this or get hold of it somehow. You can go to Ayabaya on uh, YouTube you can go to the streaming media service, if you type that in, streaming media service, Cambridge, and search for Gurungs, and go to my website, and you can either look under um, the projects, where you'll find the Gurung projects, 
or you can look at um, publications and you can find all that most of my articles and other things that I've written about as free PDF downloads. So there's a great deal to follow up on. Um, I just want to end by saying thank you to all of you for watching this and we'll have a few questions I believe and particularly to say what a great pleasure looking at the screen seeing I.B. Gurung uh, watching this from Hong Kong, uh, Manu Gurung, uh, all sorts of um, friends over the years. Uh, all of you are much younger than me but looking back from the age of 78 to 50 years spent in another society is an enormous pleasure and privilege. Um, I'll end with a, a, a joke. When I went to the Gurongs, um, I came to admire them hugely, as you can see. I thought that they were the nicest people I'd ever met. They were warm, they were humorous, they were trustworthy, they were kind, uh, everything that human beings should be. So I had a huge um, attraction to them. And I learned that they were just like me, that the Western idea that somehow people in other societies who have less education or less technology are, are less intelligent or less sensitive or whatever is complete rubbish. I was completely equal with Dilmaya, who was an uneducated village woman, as I was and admired her as much as I did my colleagues in Cambridge, if not more so. So I, I really, from my experience, what I learned from the Gurungs was how wonderful human beings can be in different circumstances and how we are all one set of brothers across the world. That was my main lesson from the Gurungs. But when people, I told people this, they say, well, was there no downside to it? And I say, well, the field work was difficult. The downside really is that there are so few Gurungs there should be more of them. There are only about half a million and the world would be a better place with more of them. Um, so that was the only negative thing I could think of. When I went to China, and I've been to China 18 times and go there every year and made many, many Chinese friends as I have Gurung friends and many of them are young people many of them are students and colleagues. And I found them, many of them of course are um, ethnic peoples very similar to the Gurungs, but they're also the Han. I found their character very, very similar. They're kind, generous, warm, humorous, intelligent, rational people. And so now I can say, well, there are half a million Gurungs and 1.4 billion Chinese. So the world is going to be a better place soon uh, when we forget about the Americans. Um, and on that political note, I better stop before I launch out on anything else. But thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk and to all of you for watching. And now over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. yeah, again, yeah, you have stopped sharing. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor McFerlin, for giving such a wonderful talk today. Uh, do you listen to me, by the way? Do you hear me? Yes, Sorry. I can hear you. Yeah. 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 Really great Good. to having you today. A pleasure. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we are all really, um, I think, excited to hear, and, uh, and uh, there are probably many questions too. Before I read out questions, actually, I would also like to add a few things uh, in addition to uh, what Dr. Homegurum had already introduced to all of us today. Well, uh, 
my introduction to Professor Mark Harlan goes back to 1994 when I went to Cambridge University to do my MPhil degree under him. Actually, I am really privileged, honored to be his student. And uh, at the same time, I would like to also mention Madam Sarah Harrison, who has been the, I mean, driving force, engine behind Professor McFarlane, and who has been always very helpful in terms of like really providing lots of lessons, guidance, and uh, insights to me as well, which I am still continuing to learn nowadays. And in this connection, and also like to uh, also reiterate one point that uh, he uh, had given us a task, uh, particularly Anita, to translate the films he had taken with uh, Dumaya, and those are like real great assets. And as he already said, there are so many things which we can, I think, uh, utilize for Guru research further. Uh, without further doing, I think I would now like to uh, also uh, mention a couple of things that uh, as a summary of his talk, uh, not, uh, you have already heard a lot, but what I felt is that he has given a huge chunk of information about uh, these 50 years. I, I believe many of us uh, were probably not born then, but those memories have been really, really important for all of us. That's one chunk of huge, huge bit of information that we got. Another bit of information we got is that uh, the way he became an uh, anthropologist or he did research with gurus so that I believe for all those young guru people, I think uh, will be useful how he did his research in the past and uh, how relevant even today are. Uh, so that's a second. And third uh, chunk he had given is, uh, very importantly, all the lessons that he learned about uh, how hardworking Guru people are, how different uh, kind of ideas he had before coming here and how he changed entirely a kind of a new turn to understand the world. And at the end, he said that uh, how wonderful people Gurungs are. I think we are very much flattered as Gurung people. <laughs> Thank you, Professor McFarland, for all those really, really kind words. Uh, beyond that, now I would like to uh, read out a few important questions that are being put by uh, some uh, Gurung friends around. Uh, and probably because there are too many uh, questions, so I may not read all them out, but maybe try to uh, accommodate uh, in, in a, a representative questions of uh, many of them. Uh, let me first... Uh, yes. Uh, Can I just take one minute comfort break, as they call it? Oh, I'll sure. One minute. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, Sarah. Dr. Sarah Parker, how are you? Namaste, home and everybody. Namaste. 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 Namaste.
Okay. Think, lovely okay. to see so many people here. Right, right, right. So, yes, Aga has come back. Yes, Aga has come back. Yeah. So, the first question I take uh, is from Gehendra Guru. I think you have already given so many important messages. His question is, what would be your top three messages that you like to pass on, say, to the new Guru generation to preserve, protect their culture? That's first question. And the second question is, do you think Gurungs who have migrated to UK will be able to continue their cultural practices in their new country? And if so, how? This is the uh, question by Mr. Gehendra Guru. Please, Age. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, on preserving the culture, Obviously, one thing is uh, to keep strong contacts with your Gurung family and friends in Nepal, and if possible, to visit um, wherever your village and area was um, and see how life is there and spend time, some time in Nepal. It's very easy to lose your roots, and therefore, physical visiting and actually participating and going back is important. In terms of Gurung language, some Gurung parents of the older generation try to preserve the language. Um, and if you can do that and learn some basic Gurung at least, that's very important. But I understand that, you know, it may not be easy to do that. Um, but the th third thing, and obviously do any research, join any Gurung organization that you can hear of. There are good ones in the UK and elsewhere, Tamu Pier Lusang and so on. So you can join organizations, you can um, read about your ancestors. Um, and in terms of... Um, keeping up your cultural practices. I, I didn't talk about this, but one of the things that I've always been interested in is how societies retain their cultural identities through time and in different circumstances. As an English historian, I have always been amazed at how the English, for example, over a thousand years remained the same English people in their basic ideas, concepts, and law, and so on. And then when they went in the empire, I've studied my ancestors going to India from the 18th century, um, going to Jamaica in the 17th century, and so on. Wherever the English went, they remained English, as do the French and other people. What has struck me about spending time in Gurung households in the UK is that they remain Gurung. Um, the one I know best has a little ancestor, a Puelu, uh, in the corner of the room. They wear Gurung dress on particular special occasions. They eat, sometimes eat with their hands and eat rice and traditional food. And the most important thing is that the family relations within a Gurung household is what really creates Gurunghood. The kindness of parents to their children, the treating of men and women as absolutely equal. Um, many things you learn from the moment you're born, how to respect older, older people, all those things which are central to Gurung culture in the education in the first five years or so are still being passed on. Which is, when, which is why when I visit Gurungs, whether it's in England or Hong Kong or Kathmandu or any other part, I feel I am with similar people to the ones who were in the village. They don't change because they're living in cities. And perhaps the Gurungs are particularly good at retaining this identity because as Tech explained, They've had this long migration of history of thousands of years coming down from a lake where they were probably fishers and hunters down through Western China 
practicing different kinds of agriculture across Tibet um, as herders coming down uh, as forest dwellers and then down into the rice and then down into the army and then down. So the Gurungs have, as a group, had thousands of years of being able to maintain their Gurung identity against uh, any kind of challenge. And just because they now live in cities doesn't mean they don't, they stop being Gurungs. They're just as much Gurungs. They may not speak the language, but their character and deeper culture in many ways are the same. And I think will be maintained forever. But now that there are resources like the films I've mentioned and other things for you to see how traditional Gurung culture worked and learn about it through books and simple guides, then you can enrich what your identity is by learning about your own history and past. So that would be my advice, not to worry that it will be lost. It won't be lost, but you can, as it were, polish it up and make it richer by some effort. Okay. Thank you so much for the answer. And uh, another important question uh, is about your experience about uh, translating uh, Bernard Pini's book. Uh, uh, would you like to just share uh, uh, why uh, you had uh, edited some of the materials and uh, why you uh, also uh, thought some of the important things to be inserted, uh, etc. So maybe that's an kind of experience of translating uh, from French to Gurungs. So uh, maybe that will give us some idea about translation to uh, further research studies in Gurung community. So uh, the question is raised by Krishna Guru and uh, would like to have uh, the experience of translating this Guru uh, document from uh, French to English. Please. Thank you. Well, the first thing I should say is that I didn't really do the translation. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I sort of supervised it and I did it a little bit. My school French was pretty basic um, and my spoken French um, not so good either. In fact, uh, I'll tell you a, a, a funny story. When I went to study uh, Pinier's manuscripts and his photographs, which are in an archive. Okay, sorry, Agi, because of the technical hits, we had some <laughs> time yeah. lag. Anyway, now uh, I think you were uh, responding some of the questions already, or shall I read another question? Um, well, the question was about translating. Yes, uh, experience. Yeah. Pinier. Okay. Mm, yeah. Oh, I'm glad, glad to see Sarah Parker there. Yes. Sarah. <laughs> she has a um, question too. Mm. So, um, th what I was saying was that I, I didn't really do the translation of, of Pinied. It was done originally mainly by Jill, my first wife, and then um, finished off by Sarah. Um, and so she did the technical part. It was a very important book to translate because it it filled in many of the things which I didn't manage to cover or knew that Pinier had already covered about the social structure and so on. Um, there were one or two uh, things that he'd missed out and that's why I put in um, a number of appendices on witchcraft and other things that um, he had not uh, written about. And we also put in a what turned out to be quite a contentious appendix about Gurung history um, by Bovar and Yajung. And this caused quite a lot of trouble because as you know, particularly with um, small groups who are trying to maintain their cultural identity, there is a lot of, of dispute about what that identity is and who you are and particularly what your history is. So um, history is something which is very politically alive for many peoples in the world and that's no different for the Gurung. So we tried, I translated it or we translated it as accurately as we could 
though it's worth just pointing out something which most of you won't know, which is that the book, because Pinier died before the book was fin finalized, he just left a manuscript. And so it was um, published, edited and published by Louis Dumont, a great French structural anthropologist. And Dumont had his own ideas of, about the Gurungs and uh, particularly about their social structure. So there are some elements which have are reinterpretations of Gurung culture, particularly the uh, Jat system, the Sajat, the four Jats, Sorajat 16, or the Plegi and Kugi, which are, I think, not necessarily what Pinier would have written, but um, putting his bits and pieces together, uh, Dumont turned it into a much more, um, what should we say, Hindu Indian model, because Dumont was a great expert on India, Hindu civilization, Homo Harakakas. And therefore the central feature of um, the system, which is three, Kugi and Songi, rather than Pligi, um, gets a bit overlaid in the published book, um, and particularly the chapter on social structure, which Dumont published. So that was uh, something we didn't really correct at the time, but it's worth knowing. Um, and as I mentioned, unfortunately, it led to some uh, hard feelings on the part of some who had a different interpretation and didn't mind the book itself, but um, felt that one or two of the appendices were slanted in a certain direction. So actually, uh, so in that connection, there was probably a related question uh, of Major uh, Uday Bahadur Gurung, retired Major Uday Bahadur Gurung. So I think uh, it's also related to how you have uh, analyzed um, the translation of like the terminologies used for the Sogi Gurungs like Lama, Lamchane, Ghali, Kotani into Lam, Lam uh, or Khon. So because why he is asking this question is uh, he hasn't been able to find out a really good analysis uh, uh, in that uh, reference. So, uh, so in, in the connection of translation, perhaps uh, you can also um, share some of your uh, ideas about how these things uh, could be seen in a historical perspective. Well, the translation, as far as I know, was as exact as possible. So right. we, didn't, we didn't change any of Pinyard's words. If he said Kwan Mei, we put Kwan Mei. If he said Lam Mei or Lam Chane or whatever, we put that. So there was no alteration Mm -hmm. as far as I know in, in that way. Um, I'm not sure whether you're asking what my own interpretation is. Um, and no. uh, well, uh, Uday Badu was asking uh, whether these translations are really the kind of translation that appears to be in, in the book in a way. Yes. Mm. Okay. Whatever, whatever was, I mean, it would be not too difficult um, to actually look at the French edition. I mean, it's quite difficult to get hold of, but and there must be copies around. And to look at the French edition and see what the English edition mm -hmm. are. As far as I know, I mean, I certainly wouldn't have, if it said Quan Mei, I, uh, none of us would have translated that, that as something else. So okay. there was no, I mean, uh, Sarah can um, confirm that, but I, I d we didn't make any uh, substantive translation changes at all. And that's mm -hmm. why, in fact, I did uh, um, some footnotes and also appendices, because what you do when you translate is not to alter what the author wrote at all, right. but to add things so you can see what my voice is. My voice is in the appendices and in some of the footnotes. It's not there present in uh, the actual book itself. Okay. But remember one thing about, um, an important thing to remember about Pinhead, 
he was just a, a, a hippie. He was just a, a wandering Frenchman in Kathmandu, young man wandering around the world. And he decided he wanted to do something serious while he was in Nepal. So he happened to meet Führer Heimendorf, my supervisor, said, you know, what would you advise? And he said, well, why don't you go and spend the time with the Gurus? And this is very early. This is, you know, early 60s. So he went to Maharia and he didn't stay there very long. He was there about four or five months. And it's an extraordinary achievement for someone to write as detailed an ethnography as that on the basis of four or five months field work. He obviously learned Gurung very fast and knew it quite well. He had an excellent fieldwork assistant, C.B. Gotane. And uh, later I checked all the book with C.B. Gotane and he seemed at the time happy with what we translated. He looked at it all. Later, um, maybe re-examining it or may maybe talking to his friends, he felt that some of, perhaps not what I'd done, but some of what Pinier had done and what was in one or two of the appendices by other people weren't uh, in line with what some of his friends thought. So there was some difference of opinion then. But I can, I think I can assure you, Sarah's looking through the book at the moment, uh, near me, that nothing in the book itself, I mean, nothing in Pinier's text was, had to be changed or was changed at all. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean it's right, because as I say, he wasn't there for long. He got it through the eyes of a um, plegi or songi uh, person. Uh, in other words, through the eyes of C.B. Gotane. Right. And there's another famous book about the Himalayas, Hindus of the Himalayas by Berriman. And uh, if you're interested in anthropology, you should read the preface to Berriman's book because there it's one of the few accounts of how your informant shapes what you see because what happened with Berriman was that he went in and he got an upper group informant and saw the society in one way and then the informant had to leave and he got a, a lower group informant and he saw an entirely different society. Now the fact that uh, Pinyed saw Mohiria mainly through the eyes of C.B. Gotane, gives it a certain slant. I didn't consciously, but by chance, my friends in Tak were of both the Kugi and Songi. So one of my fathers, Bowen Singh, uh, was Kebje um, and from the Kugi. Bhadra Singh was. Um, Kwanme and therefore from the other group. So I, I saw Tark and the Gurun through both sets of lenses as it were and it's important to try and do that as an anthropologist not just see it through one person's eyes. Um, the other thing is that you should realize that there is maybe a bit of a shock to you but there's no such thing as truth. In other words you cannot have the final word on the Gurungs. They there are different stories and myths and ideas and they none of them is absolutely true and they probably all got bits of truth so those who think that the Gurung have a southern origin and those who think it have a, a northern origin there are probably elements of both those because if you look at the long ramblings and wanderings of people they came to where they are in all sorts of different ways and they are mixes of all sorts of different peoples. And therefore, you have to be tolerant about other opinions because they may contain some truth in them. And therefore, it's not sensible to dismiss them entirely. So, Gurung history is contested, but um, luckily, and thanks partly to your own work, Tech, um, it's now much more clear about what it, that history is. Here is the book, by the way, um, The Gurungs by Pinyard, the French edition. Um, and that's what we translated. And Sarah gave me the chapter five is the one which has been quite substantially altered by Dumont called 
organization, clan, the clan and hierarchical organization of the Gurungs. That is the Gurung seen through the eyes of a French structuralist anthropologist, Dumont, as well as through the eyes of C.B. Gautane and Bernard Pinier. Well, thank you so much. This is really uh, insightful and really important for all of us to understand uh, uh, the realities of the Gurung people of Nepal. Thank you so much for those very insightful, uh, very important thoughts for us. Well, uh, thank you. And there are other questions related to witchcraft. There are two questions actually. One is from Mr. Gaugurung and another is from Shara Parker herself. So Gaugurung asks that, is there similarities in witchcraft uh, in Western and Nepali Gurung societies? That's one. And maybe if I read uh, Shara Parker's question, then so you can uh, answer both uh, together. Sarah Parker is asking, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read. <laughs> Where is it? Sarah is there, she can ask me. <laughs> yeah, directly, maybe Sarah, would you mind asking that way? <laughs> because then, then I'm copying, pasting here. Yeah, yeah, well, well, yeah, well, yeah I, I can read. Where which is always considered to be negative or was there a respect for their powers and why has the belief in witches dies away when others with power and knowledge about rituals remain so embedded in the culture? That's Sarah Parker. So did, did you say why has uh, knowledge of the witches Oh no, it's, it's no, a... Alan, yeah, just to, just to clarify, you said that the belief in witches, that people don't believe in them as much anymore, but, but they yeah. still do believe in them. And are there cases of good witches as well as bad? Because you mentioned there was 15. So is it that in the 60s, people would admit to witchcraft, but now it's more hidden because society sees it as being negative? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shada. Yeah. Nice to talk to you. Um, the first question, there are similarities um, between Gurung witchcraft and the witchcraft I studied in England for the 17th century. Um, for example, I mean, the central feature of witchcraft is that it's a belief that certain people have inside them some evil power which comes from who knows what. And allows that person either through saying certain spells and charms or doing certain things or even just hating someone and wishing them evil through that power they can harm them in some way or other that is the the core of witchcraft supernatural power to affect other people probably negatively in that respect guru and witchcraft and um, English witchcraft are similar. But beyond that, there, there are obviously huge differences. English witchcraft and European witchcraft is within the context of Christianity. And I talked earlier about monotheism. It's within the context of a belief system which believes in a God and in an anti-God or the devil or Satan. So English witches have their primary power from the devil, from Satan. They are the devil's servants. So in some areas they form into little groups and called covens and they worship the devil and so on and so on. Now, there's none of that in Gurung witchcraft. They are single individuals. They don't form, they may, I suppose, know each other, but they don't have rituals and meetings and so on and so on. And that is a, a pretty big difference between them. Um, English witches actually didn't fly through the air, though some of the European witches did. And therefore, um, the way in which um, Nepalese witches operated and so on, there are quite a lot of small and significant differences, but also great similarity. I'll just tell you a funny story because two of the characteristics of witches when I was there first were, one was that they, they usually went around at night flashing lights from their fingers. 
and um, also they had armor, metal, underneath their clothes to protect them. And so they went around flashing lights and clanking. So I used to wonder why when I went out at night to empty the toilet bucket uh, with my torch, people would suddenly scream and disappear very quickly. And they obviously thought I was a clanking and flashing witch walking around the village paths. Anyway, um, so there are similarities and differences. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. On Sarah's point, um, those 15 or so witches, of course, I knew who they were. And some of them seemed to me really nice people. I mean, all of them seemed nice people, but some of them really, some of them, some are, as the old saying is, some of my best friends were witches. Um, I really, you know, I wouldn't have known, of course. Um, I couldn't understand why they'd chosen a per perfectly friendly, nice, usually a woman, usually an older woman, in fact, all women, I think. Um, but of those 15 or whoever the number there were, they were all uh, considered bad, nothing good about them. In, in English um, witchcraft, European witchcraft, you have white witches and you have black witches. Black witches are the evil ones and the white witches are basically like the podju. They are the witch doctors. They are the ones who heal and protect you. So if you'd applied this in Tak, you have the black witches who are the boshi. And then you have the uh, people who protect you against witchcraft and they are entirely separate people. So you can't be both at the same time. Though I suspect that some of the most powerful podju were slightly feared as people who had great mystical power and therefore you didn't really want to um, annoy them in any way. But they weren't witches in any stretch of the imagination. So there was no overlap in individuals in black and white. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, another question uh, is from Tara Guru. She says that uh, in the last 50 years, the, uh, the village where you worked in Thar has uh, actually uh, yeah, gone to a lower scale of uh, development or so. So uh, in the context of coronavirus, uh, probably the village may become vibrant again. In your opinion, how long will it take to bring back the village back to life uh, as it was five decades ago? That's one question Tara Gurung has asked you. Thank you, Tara. Um, that's a, a very interesting question. Um, I didn't really talk much about the change over those 50 years because of other things to say, but of course it, it is an absolutely extraordinary transformation. Um, even when I went back in 1986, it was changing a certain amount, but a lot of it was still there. The dancing, the singing in the evenings, the gato um, wasn't being done actually in Tark, even in 1986. But a lot of it was still there. And it stayed like that roughly until the Maoist period, 2002. And it was really that period, the three or four years of the Maoist rising, when the village changed hugely, because that's the first set of gurus leaving left like I.B. and um, Bohan Singh in the late 70s or in the 70s. And then the next, the exit of the gurus really was during the Maoist period. So when we went back in 2006, the village had changed a great deal. A lot of the people had left. So that's the second big change. And then around, uh, I.B. will know, because he was involved in making the road to the village, but whenever it was, around 2012, something like that, when there was a road up to the village, when electricity reached the village, when mobile phones reached the village, when, and so on. In other words, during the last 10 years, and probably the last six, seven years, the village again changed hugely. Most of the remaining Gurungs left 
and now I haven't we haven't done a census for a few years but I suspect that something like 90% or 80% of the people in Tark in that area are not Gurung now they're either Brahmins, Chetris, um, blacksmiths, tailors and so on and the Gurung village itself is now inhabited when I was first here the, the idea that blacksmiths and tailors would be living in the central Gurung houses was more or less unthinkable but that's where they are now so the people have changed and of course um, in that way and in many way, other ways the atmosphere has changed so much of the social life is no longer um, another change was obviously in the agriculture because a number of the fields particularly in the more remote areas went to banjo or went to just being overgrown and so in some ways it was uh, developing as has happened all over Europe in France and Italy and Spain and other places where it changed into a suburb of a city in other words the inhabitants would keep their houses but they would go back up for a festival or a funeral or something special but life was in the city and so this is how we found it in our last visit in 2017 um, where instead uh, just to give you a pen portrait for many years we would go in in the evening and sit by a wood fire with a little bochi burning kerosene lamp and in the early days the women would come in and start singing and dancing and and so on later on we'd sit around the fire and talk and so on when we last went um, to the village and we went for the evening meal in a neighboring house and there was an electric light burning so no longer a bocce so it's just like a rather weak bulb they were cooking on gas so there was no fire and of the six people sitting there four of them were on their mobile phones for most of the evening um, not talking to us at all so it was basically like having supper in Cambridge so um, the atmosphere as far as we were concerned had changed hugely now the last part of the question is interesting about whether Covid will bring back life to the village um, I don't know you'll have to tell me uh, Shana will have to tell me if he's watching whether this has happened because he's been up in the village he's been quarantining and he's just come down so I hope he will tell me whether life is coming back to the tack or not you'll only see it if you if you get there I don't know but the other thing that I'd hoped was that what happened in Europe is that the villagers left and deserted their villages up in the in the Alps and in the mountains apparently they went down to the cities but then they remembered their life so there was a partial remigration in the summer they would go up and they would tend just one or two fields and pick the fine grapes and so on and so there was some sort of social return and life in the village the other thing is that um, as the pressures grow in pokra um, many people may feel that if there's a really good road and I gather the road to Tark is going to be much improved because it was falling to pieces if there's a really good road and you can get up to Tark in 20 minutes um, why not live in a beautiful mountain village and if you have a job or work and you're not doing it on electronic communication why not work in go down for work and live in the village or spend your weekends there so these villages may pick up life from a but in a different way entirely because the ultimate problem is you cannot no young person who has ambitions who wants to be well educated who wants to get a paid good job and then to marry and educate their own children they cannot easily think of a future living in a mountain village the work is too hard too little paid the facilities are too poor in where in education and so on so the attraction of going out is too huge for people 
with any kind of energy and ambition to want to stay there. The blacksmiths and tailors do it by staying, but sending their young men to work. But then again, the closing up of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and so on through COVID may drive people back and they are forced for a while to go back to the life which we saw. But I think it'll only be temporary. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I didn't read many names uh, who had uh, similar questions about transformation of village. I'm sorry for if I didn't pronounce your names, uh, but I think uh, in the whole, uh, Professor McFarland has given answer to the transformation of the village and uh, and so forth. So now, actually, I have very um, limited number of. Uh, representative questions now. One is about uh, <clears throat> that in present time there are many other non-gurungs, uh, religion, culture, festivals and so on around the world and gurungs are migrating glo globally and gurungs are con uh, contacted with other religion and cultures and even daily activities. How do you think about influences that affect or stop to preserve and promote the original and indigenous Tamil cultures, religions, and lifestyles. It's been asked by Ruk Tamu, uh, Vek Guru, and so many others. This is a representative one I just read. So again, your turn. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it's really the same question as the first one I uh, answered, which is how do you preserve Gurung culture and will it be preserved and identity? And I gave quite a long answer to that. Um, the thing, one thing I'd add is that the Gurungs are, as I'd explained in relation to their many religious beliefs, they are extremely tolerant people. They are used to mixing different kinds of belief system, so believing to a certain extent in Hinduism, Buddhism, shamanism, ancestors. And so they have no difficulty in living in pluralistic worlds elsewhere. They don't find it any threat to be living next door to a Christian or to anyone else, because they themselves are a mixture of all sorts of different beliefs and so on. And they held these in balance. So they will deal with this situation in many ways better than many Westerners who are much more closed in in their worlds um, and feel threatened by other belief systems. Um, but as I said in the first part, I think that particularly because of the child rearing system and the way that young gurus are uh, taught to uh, interact with other people, I mean, something I didn't say in my talk, one of the things that I learned from the Gurungs was how good people who live in a very strong community like the Gurungs are at social relations. The delicacy of dealing with other people, how you are courteous and listen to people and treat people as human beings, whether they're children, whether they're old people, whether they're people from another group, that careful uh, behavior within a community was immensely impressive. I've seen it sometimes at its best in communities that I belong to in the West, like a Cambridge College, but often it's not nearly as tactful and well-behaved as a Gurung village. Basically, in a Gurung village, you have to be very, very careful on what you say, what you do, where you go, because everyone knows everything you're doing. And if you say something negative about someone, it'll get back to them. Something that does happen in Cambridge too, and I had to learn, you have to be very careful because you don't know who's gonna talk to who. And this makes um, the work of an anthropologist in a place uh, like the Gurungs, both much more exciting but more challenging because 
every person you talk to, when I talk to Dilmaya, or I talk to IB or Bhadra Singh, they know they are risking their life in that village by talking to you. Not just talking to you, though that may be dangerous, but what they say, because if you then pass it on to the wrong person. So building up trust that what you discuss with one person doesn't go to another person. And what we, one of the great pleasures we discovered was the way in which over time, I trusted them and they trusted us sufficiently to tell us many things that they wouldn't even tell their neighbors or their other members of the family because they felt that we would use it in the right way and not pass it on. So I've got off the question, which is about preserving Gurung culture, but I think I more or less answered it in the beginning. So you can, if you missed that answer, you can watch the recording. You're switched off, Tech. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, there are, I think now, only a couple of questions, but many thanks and best regards to you uh, because of such a wonderful uh, talk that you have given to our community here around the globe. Um, now one of the important questions here is, uh, what are the differences you found or similar Semanistic practices in Chinese ethnic groups. Uh, can those be compared with Gurungs? That's one. And uh, second is, uh, is there any advice for uh, the state intervention to revive uh, Gurung villages? Uh, the first one is from Dr. Hong Gurung. The second one is from Sundar Gurung. Um, those are the two questions. I think the, with this, probably, uh, we have uh, already crossed quite a lot of time. Perhaps we might want to, uh, if uh, Ivy Dai is happy to share some thoughts uh, to, to, to this forum. Otherwise, I think we have quite a, a lot of time already spent. So I think these are the last two questions first, please. Thank you. Um, well, on the Chinese shamanism, Pinyad himself noticed a similarity between Gurung uh, myths and rituals and priests in particular and some an account of the uh, Nashi or Naki uh, religion of Yunnan, which is an ethnic minority group in Yunnan. And uh, you've been to this area, Tech, and I've been to it and there are some a lot, quite a lot of similarities in small things like dress and also in some of the rituals and so on it's not at all identical but there's enough of a similarity for one to feel um, that they have probably influenced each other and your own work on the DNA of the Gurungs shows that that indeed is the case that the Gurungs came down through that area that there is Nashi and the other Yunnanese group blood in the Gurung DNA. And therefore, it's not surprising because in many ways, the shamanism is a pan-Himalayan, pan-Asian um, phenomenon. You find elements of it in Japan, you find elements of it right across China, as well as in the minority groups. And very often it has a family resemblance. A family resemblance means that the nose and the mouth are the same, but the eyes are different. In other words, they will beat on a one-sided drum, or their bits of the ritual language sound similar, or the beliefs about spirits have some overlap. So it's not identical, but there's a lot of overlap. And something I didn't say, but in relation, I've, I've looked at some of the shamanism in the minorities in China and read a bit more about it. What is extraordinary, and this is a very important message for all of you, young Gurungs, you are members of a group which has the finest, the best, the most important, the richest 
um, Pielu uh, tradition, songs, myths um, in the world, or at least in the Himalayas. Having looked, having looked right down through Burma, Western China, um, Sikkim, Bhutan, and all the Nepalese groups in so far as I've read about them, like the Magars and the Rais and Limbus and so on, there is nothing nearly as important and rich as your tradition. I mean, I, I've never done the work and someone needs to do the work because I've got all the stuff I gathered on the myths and rituals and Simon Strickland's pu published his. But if you added up all the, the rituals that have been documented and there are many others that haven't and, and looked at the myths, you'll find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of long complicated rituals and myths were preserved over 2000 years by the Gurung coming down from Northern China in their shamanic trip. And were still alive in 1968 and still alive in remote parts of uh, Nepal now, no doubt. And still, so as IB would tell you, there's still lots of work to be done and particularly to make it all preserved forever. And um, in terms of what the government could do, um, we have talked, you and I, about a Gurung cultural center in Kathmandu. I think the government, when it becomes even richer than it is now and more organized than it is now, could well uh, encourage through some state support, Gurung cultural activities, uh, both in Kathmandu, Pokhara and elsewhere, so that, for example, the Gurung Museum in Pokhara could well be refurbished properly and that will be expensive uh, and IB has had dreams and ideas on that for a long time. And that's the sort of thing which, not a huge amount of money, but some real state interest in, would make a big difference. Just to value, because if the government also is aware that there is no other group in Nepal, no other group in the Himalayas, which is as important ethnographically, in, I mean, in terms of anthropology and in terms of our knowledge of early shamanism, as the Gurungs, then perhaps they will step up and do something. Thank you. Thank you so much. By the way, when there was some technical problem, at that time we had a little bit of uh, talk about uh, the contribution of Madam Sarah Harrison. Uh, we wonder if she is around and uh, could be sent to us. <laughs> she, she, she's here, and she, as as you know, with Anita, the real powerhouse and the real absolutely uh, who is uh, the center of your world, it's Anita. Yes. And yes. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Well, you've ended my space because I was working on the other side of this table. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, oh, we'll lovely to see you all along the top of the... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Fine. Is well, that, is that, there I thank, am. <laughs> thank you so much for coming and uh, that we all uh, really, really appreciate your contribution to the Gurung community. Well, the Gurung has given <laughs> me a tremendous amount of pleasure throughout okay. my uh, uh -huh. knowledge of them, which was from my mid-40s, I have to say. <laughs> okay. Um, it's quite a long time now, I can tell you. 30 years at least. <laughs> anyway, okay. bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I think with this, I would uh, now like to hand over the mic to Dr. Hom Gurung, uh, who would then, uh, I think, uh, conclude uh, by thanking, oh, by thanking Professor McFarlane and all the participants. Dr. Hom Gurung, floor is yours. Hello. Hello. No sound. Oh, Dr. Hom Gurung. Yes. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I think it has been a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you so much uh, again. Uh, I think it's a historic, it's a unique. 
and we got in QPS. So we have learned a great deal of you know wisdom, knowledge about the gurus, what we have learned from the gurus, and also we have learned lots about from you. So I think yeah. So yeah, yeah. You just mentioned it was always very good to see you in in a, a Nepali Bhangra, and also uh, what the, the gurus have in special occasions. So it, it was the privilege for each and everyone when you visit Park, and many people really learn and always you know smile with the happiness. So one of the very important things, what I call the final reflections. When we had a chat about this talk, that I told you that my wife is from Chia village, Park. And instantly, maybe after 20 minutes, I got this uh, house, which belongs to my five father in law. So when I married to Puna, my wife, about 33 years ago, uh, there were about 40 goats, 50 chickens. It was very lively. Uh, but today, when I go there, when you go there, it's almost empty. As you have just mentioned now in Thak village, about 80% are non gurus. Uh, despite it is just, you know, you know, well, one and a half hour drive from Pokhara, but the migration is still there. So as part of our preparation of this talk, a uh, few days ago, I contacted uh, one of our daughters who was born in Hong Kong and now in UK. So you know, a daughter of you know, ex Gurkha. So I try to link you know, the different generation that can understand how we gurus were migrated all the way from you know inner China or Mongolia that you know, Chet has you know already proven from his thesis took about eight hundred years. Then you know came to from Kola Sultan like about fifteen hundred uh, ago. So now within the next, the, 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 from the last 50 years that you've been to Thak, and now after 50 years, then our peoples are now, they are like migrating from different countries. So like the, the daughter who was born in Hong Kong and now in UK, she was very smart. I think she, she was one of the 10 students out of 10,000 students in UK who did a very good you know, excellent in Asia writing. So I try to, you know, try to understand uh, how our generation are evolving in terms of getting to know our culture, how they can transform and how they can take the lead in the future. I think I can see there are some, you know, mixed, you know, opportunities and challenges. The opportunities, because now they can, they can see the entire world. So the challenge for the parents, I think for many parents in the UK, because the parents were born in, in six place town or in the villages, so they went to Hong Kong, they finally now, they're retiring in the UK. So they, all their hearts and minds are about their village, the places where they were born and they grew up. But their kids, the children who are born in Hong Kong or the UK, so they have a different value system so like I try to even you know go through your you know biography, you know, by scale, whether she can read, but she wants to know the purpose of this. Uh, so because the way the schooling was done there, it is very different. So I think that will really bring the way people think and will be quite challenging in the future. And I think the organization like Tamudhi UK, uh, all the parents, I think need to an uh, digital rethink how our children can accommodate the way that the, in, within our culture. And, you know, culture is a process but at the same time, how we can do. So I think today, uh, like we, you, you know, spoke uh, lots of uh, Tamukyu, Tamukyu, which is very important for our generation. And there are also many gurus who don't speak guru. So it's also very opportunity, good opportunity for to learn from you. So, this is you know, very you know, important uh, and so I'd like to thank you once again, uh, you know, Dr. Tech Anita Bayani and my wife Purna here. So we met you in 2016 in, in, uh, in Tamil at uh, in, uh, Mahadir's you know, restaurant as my friend. So once again, I'd like to thank you everyone, Tech Net, 
behind the scene, uh, Ganga Bhaini uh, Ruk Burung, uh, who is our you know IT expert, social scientist, social media expert. So I'd like to thank you, everyone, for taking your Sunday, which is your family time, and joining the joining us and joining the Tetanet family. So we hope we love to meet again. And thank you very much. And I want to say goodbye uh, from my end. And thank you, Dr. Tate, for doing all the difficult tasks. Thank you very much.